Good morning and welcome to our presentation this morning. Uh, I'm Erica Schlichter. I'm with Huntley School District 158 in Northern Illinois, and I am here with Dr. John Gatta from ECRA Group in partnership with AASA. And we will be talking about uh, academic return on investment and why it's important and how we can look at that a little bit more analytically to be able to measure what's best for our students. And just as a quick introduction, um, I think it's worth just mentioning why academic return on investment. It, it sounds like a technical term. It's good business. Uh, it's good financial stewardship of our tax dollars. But best of all, it's good decision making for what's right for our students. So with that, I am going to toss it over to Dr. Gatta, and he is going to speak about the analytics. OK, great. Uh, thank you, Erica. Thank you, everybody from across the country that uh, uh, tuned into this webinar. Uh, my role in this presentation is I'm going to go through sort of the background of academic return on investment, sort of the evolution of the construct where we are today and how you can use the process of academic return on investment to drive evidence-based practice within your school district and how you can leverage academic return on investment to be more strategic as a leader. And so uh, throughout the presentation, uh, if you have questions, you can email those into questions at equigroup.com. We're going to be monitoring uh, that chat when we get to the um, our question and answer portion of this webinar, uh, we're going to go back through that and answer any questions uh, that you do have. And so uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and, and jump right in. So what is academic return on investment? Many of you have probably heard of the term academic return on investment. It is a uh, something that's really coming to the forefront, I think, because of uh, the effects of the pandemic and what we know about the pandemic and the asymmetric impact that the pandemic has had on students uh, and growth rates and learning rates of students. And as the pandemic recedes, and as we think about um, all of the innovations that we're going to be investing in and all of the work as school leaders that we're going to do to help drive that growth recovery, uh, there's a lot of emphasis played on making sure that we are understanding how the investments that we're making are actually producing return. And you know, as a school leader, you make decisions every day about how to invest the community's resources for maximum return on student outcomes. And academic return on investment is a way to work through those decisions and to quantify the impact of those decisions. So as a leader, um, you can ask the right questions. And as a leader, you can have better information and the system can have better information to ensure that all students have access uh, to the highest quality programming. And one additional word that I would uh, uh, comment on is, you know, for a long time, education talked about being research-based. I mean, I think that that was vernacular that was used and has been used and continue, uh, continually is used today to talk about more disciplined methods of selecting programs and more dis disciplined ways of ensuring that we're only administering the high the highest quality programming. But when you think about what research base really means, research base can be a low bar if you're not careful. I mean, research base just means that maybe a particular program, maybe a particular uh, intervention, it was based on research because it was based on ideas that uh, existed prior. And, and, and it may have been based on ideas that um, existed in the literature that had promise, but it doesn't mean that it's working within your school district. And so one of the things that I would uh, really promote is this idea of transitioning your thinking away from being research-based and being evidence-based. Because what it means to be evidence-based in your practice is to actually have confidence that whatever programs you're implementing work within your district, that there's evidence that students are benefiting from a particular program or a particular intervention or a particular school improvement initiative uh, within your district. And so academic return on investment is a process that you can use uh, you know, to ensure that uh, uh, that you are administering the highest quality program. So let's talk a little bit about academic return on investment. When you think about that term, right, there's really two pieces when we talk about academic return on investment. There's the investment piece, and then there's the return piece. And we really have to untangle those ideas if we're going to leverage this kind of a framework um, as school leaders. And so when you think about from a broader a standpoint, the way in which investments are made, you know, within communities and within the, the community schools are the Board of Education appropriates resources through the budgeting process, right? And so the board then um, allows the administration to make investments into programs. And so um, 
administration has the autonomy for the most part to uh, invest those resources in a way that's going to have the greatest impact uh, for students. I'm going to use the word program throughout this presentation to reflect um, any and all of those investments. And those could be actual formal programs. Those could be uh, interventions as part of uh, an MTSS process. These could be um, school improvement efforts as part of a school improvement plan. Any investment that you're making in terms of um, uh, programming, um, there's this expectation that you're going to get some return. But in financial markets, and you know, a lot of things of what happened as, as concepts go from industry to education or from education to industry, right? There's this uh, tendency to try to use the same ideas uh, and just port them over. And it doesn't work exactly like that when you think about academic return on investment as applied to schools. And the reason is, is it's the board and the community that are, that are making the investments, right? But the return piece doesn't come back to the board. It certainly doesn't come back to the board or the community in terms of um, financial return. It goes back to the student in terms of student learning. And when we talk about measuring student learning, we're really talking about the metric of student growth. So all that together, academic return on investment is about understanding the investments that we're making but then also quantifying the return of those uh, investments in terms of student growth. And that's what I'm gonna be walking you through today, how you work through this process of understanding the investments and quantifying the return. And then Erica's gonna walk through a real life case study uh, in her district. So what does the process of academic ROI look like? Well, there's four steps that you need to um, get in the habit of working through as part of, a, of an ROI process, of specifically academic ROI. And so it starts by recognizing that every single time that we decide to implement a new program or implement a, a new initiative, we are making an investment and those investments come in many forms. Once you've made those investments, then it's about asking the right question. It's about asking if in fact, this program is working, what would we expect to see? And working through making sure that every time we decide to have a school improvement effort, every single time we try to have a new program or new inter intervention, uh, we're, ask we're asking those questions, the right questions to ensure that we are uh, working through an evidence-based process to not only provide opportunities for students, but to make sure that we're monitoring that they're actually benefiting um, from those investments. Then it gets time to evaluate. So we make investments into programs. Uh, we ask the right questions in terms of what the program is designed to impact. But then how do we evaluate that? The evaluate stage is the fundamental concept of academic return on investment, because this is where we get into the piece of how do we know if a program is effective? And this is where we, I think, get to a real understanding of what academic return on investment is it's really all about the impact on students. It's easy to get distracted when we talk about academic ROI as if it has to do with finances and it's all about finances. It really isn't. Finance is really sort of the, the secondary player of this. Of course, it's a part of the process because we have to understand those investments, but the return part, the process of academic ROI is really about quantifying the impact that all of our decisions are having on student growth rates, on student learning. And then once we have that information, we can act on it. And that's where uh, the right kinds of reporting, the right kinds of information can help uh, promote uh, learning communities, can help promote the continuous quality improvement process, can help promote the school improvement process, and ultimately the, the strategic process uh, through strategic planning. So the first question, investing, what investments are we making in the program? So this is the first stage in the process in terms of um, this. Every time that we make an investment, it's really easy to skip over this step. It's really easy to just say, maybe we should try a new intervention with students. Maybe we should have uh, a different school improvement initiative. Uh, maybe we should try uh, a new way of uh, tutoring. But every time we choose to stand up a new program, we are making investments and those investments come in many forms. The easiest ones to understand are the financial investments. Uh, it's in, in certain kinds of programming, it's very easy to understand uh, what those allocations are. 
but it's not as easy to recognize that investments come in other forms. And so oftentimes in schools, it, it, it feels like it's an additive model. It feels like we add more and more and more uh, to teachers' plates, to administrators' plates, to other support staff uh, plates. And, and over time, right, that has a lot of unintended consequences of burnout and feeling overworked and feeling stressed. And we certainly know that um, in, the, in the current environment. And so the, the takeaway from this piece is when you're having the conversations around what you're investing in a particular program, go beyond the financial pieces. Make sure that you understand um, the investments that you're making in people's time. Make sure that you understand the investments that you're making uh, in terms of opportunity costs, right? Because there's a there's a whole uh, menu, right? An infinite menu of options that you have to serve students and sort of a, you know, sort of a basic rule. If you're doing something, you're not doing something else. And so working through those conversations on the front end to make sure that you're investing in programs that you believe uh, are going to be effective, but you believe are reasonable in terms of the total scope of what it takes to stand up a particular program. Once we do that, then we can ask uh, the right questions. And this is uh, the questions that you need to ask yourself is really around the idea of what is the program designed to impact? That's the first piece so that you know um, if in fact students are benefiting, what would we expect to see? But the more fundamental question that ROI answers is something that um, oftentimes is overlooked. And we sometimes ask the question, how did students in the program grow? So when you think about this, um, you know, maybe you have a new program, maybe you have an after school reading support program, and then you might have a baseline measurement on students and you may follow them uh, along. And then maybe you have a, a measurements at the end of the year or, or later on. And you, you see that students have grown and then you you sort of uh, rush to some uh, some inference in terms of that the program's effective because students are growing. But the the concept of academic ROI really asks a different question. It asks, how did students in the program grow compared to how they would have grown without the program? And this is academic return on investment. All students are being put through a core program, right? All students are coming to school. They're going through their normal courses. They may be going through certain um, uh, parts of the, the general ed um, core program. But if we're asking about the unique increment of, of an initial program, if we changed a curriculum, we don't want to just compare growth rates to basically no growth because students are going to grow. We want to compare how students grew compared to how they would have grown without the program. It's this idea of the control group. It's this counterfactual of recognizing that the investment only provides a return if it produces results better than we would have gotten anyway had we never implemented the program. So how do you do that? Well, this is where the advancements in analytics and predictive models can really help untangle these uh, these different pieces. And so if you think about in a very simple way, you have per student performance on the y-axis and we have sort of a time on the x-axis. And you know, as school as students work through schooling as they go from grade level to grade level, as they go through terms from uh, fall, winter, and spring, they're growing and that's sort of uh, indicated by that uh, that growing arrow there. But throughout that, we introduce programs, right? And so students interact with a variety of programs as they're growing, as they're just matriculating through our system. Well, if we can keep track of when we're introducing programs to students and we have good records about which students participated in which programs, then we're in a position to use predictive models to say, if a particular student was to continue their learning rates, if they were continued to grow at rates they've been growing, what we know about this student, how they performed on a multitude of data elements across multiple points in time, and what we know about similar students across our system, we can project out where that student is going to likely end up in the future if in fact we don't do anything special. By special, I mean if we don't implement a new program or they don't participate um, in a new school improvement initiative, they, if they continue their learning trajectory, this is where they're likely going to end up without a particular program. But then what we can do is we can follow that student over that same course of time, and then we can assess them or collect other uh, 
um, pieces of data to say, well, where did they perform as a result of the participation? Now we have two really important data points. We have where they were projected to be without participation in a program against where they actually ended up having participated in a, in a program. This difference is return on investment. So when we talk about academic return on investment, we're talking about this distance, the gap between where students were projected to be having not participated in the program against where they actually ended up. And this process can be repeated over and over and over again, because so long as we have data together in terms of uh, student performance, and as long as we are keeping track of uh, which students are participating in which programs at which points in time, this becomes a data analysis task and a reporting task. And you could consider um, using this framework to analyze all of your programs. And so how, how do we actually report this, this metric? And so what I mean by this is that graph that I just had up that had projected achievement having not participated in the program against actual achievement um, as a result of participation, we have now this, this distance, this gap between the projection and the actual values, right? So how do we measure that distance? Well, there's a lot of ways that you might think about uh, measuring that distance. Uh, the method that uh, we promote uh, at Ekron that we believe is, is uh, the most well-researched that has a long history in the statistical communities and has a long history uh, in the educational communities is the metric of an effect size. And so effect sizes are great because one, they have an embedded comparison within them, right? That's what's, that's what's wonderful about effect sizes is an effect size of zero doesn't mean that a student didn't grow, right? It means that, um, the um, the difference between their projection and their actual value is the same. And so uh, that's what's really nice about effect sizes, because if you have an effect size of zero or near zero, it means that the program really didn't provide value added impact above and beyond the core program, uh, but it did uh, produce results that, that were similar. But then we can use well-established um, research thresholds to say, well, what about programs that produce positive ROI? And by positive ROI, we mean effect sizes that are 0.3 or greater. These are programs that provide strong evidence that students are benefiting as a result of particip uh, participation, that rates of growth are uh, greater um, having participated in the program than they would have been if a student had not participated in the program. But then we have negative ROI. We have programs that actually produce results that are worse, or, and by worse, I mean actually resulted in growth rates that are uh, lower than had the student never participated at all. Now, you may ask yourself, you know, how how is that possible? How is it that you could actually stand up a program and have growth rates that were worse than having never done the program at all. Well, this does happen, and this is referred to as, as negative ROI, and this happens when a particular program is designed in a way in which having to participate in one program, right, may uh, result in you not participating in some other forms of instruction. And so a lot of times programs or school improvement initiatives or interventions replace one instruction for another. Well, if the new instruction is not as effective as the one you've replaced, you could end up with negative ROI. And this doesn't mean that these, that these programs are bad. It doesn't mean that you just uh, immediately um, uh, shut those programs down. But what it means is you might have an implementation gap. You might need to continue to monitor that program through the continuous quality improvement process. And it's really natural and it, it's it's the case given our experience that uh, programs take a little bit of time to, to show their value. And so you may not have positive ROI for a particular program the first year out. Uh, you may have to implement that program a year or two before you go from green to blue. But what a framework like this allows you to do is change the way you do business. Evaluate every program every year as just a way of doing business. And you can have you can have visibility into uh, what that process looks like. And so you could consider 
listing every single one of your programs that you're running and listing next to it the number of students uh, that you're serving. You could list the financial allocations that you're making in those programs and then right alongside it, the effect size or this ROI, the academic return on investment of those programs. Think about how this would change the conversation. Think about every time there's a new school improvement effort, every time that you stand up a new intervention for students, every time there's a new program, it just goes in and you report on it every year in terms of the return you're getting so that when it comes time to make decisions around budgeting and investments, uh, that you have a more rich set of information uh, that you can dialogue around. And so before I turn it over to Erica, I do want to make one last comment regarding academic return on investment and some of the things that you may see within uh, the industry in terms of what academic uh, return on investment is. And so some of you may have seen this formula in certain places where they say academic return on investment is the learning increase times the number of students served mm -hmm. or the dollars spent. And so what that basically is, is the, is the elements that I just reported on the previous slide. Um, we highly advise not using um, these formulas. And the reason that we, uh, we advise against that is uh, for a couple of reasons. One is a philosophical conceptual piece of academic return on investment is really about how students are benefiting. Right. And it's really about making sure that all students and that we have visibility into all students and whether they are, in fact, benefiting from participation in a particular program. What happens when you combine the sort of student outcome pieces with the dollar pieces is it confounds both of those. And I can give you plenty of examples of which this formula will produce really nonsensical results that you uh, you may show higher academic return on investment when the program's actually producing in in our things those those yellow or red uh, returns, but it comes up as having higher academic ROI because it doesn't cost much money. Well, any dollar is too much money spent if it actually provides no value or in worst cases actually does worse or harms students. And so for that, um, I would highly advise not using um, these kinds of formulas, but instead to just take the values of that formula, but put, put those uh, elements alongside each other so you can have better visibility into the investments and that you can have a clean metric in terms of how students are benefiting. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Erica to walk you through a real uh, life example of a journey that she went through uh, in her school district. And again, remember, any questions that you do have, email those in at questions at echogroup.com. And at the end, we're going to get, uh, get all those answered. Erica? Thank you, John. Um, so we are going to take a look at a case study uh, within our district. Like John said, um, we do this for many programs. And in fact, we use these types of analytics and effect sizes for other purposes as well. But in terms of academic ROI, we wanted to spotlight and really share an example relating to um, one particular program that is in its fourth year in Huntley District 158. I'll tell you ahead of time, one of the reasons I chose this to spotlight is because it's not simple. It's not something we purchased, we put the kids in it, and then we measure it. That, that would be a pretty straightforward um, type of example. This one's a little bit more complex, and I think it's going to show a good example of how we can work through those steps of return on investment. So a little bit of background about the program. Um, several years ago, the state of Illinois uh, offered the opportunity for initially 10 districts to apply to be a part of a competency-based education pilot. Um, so Illinois uh, was not a competency-based state the way some are across the country, and they were looking for some data and for some school districts to try. So Huntley District 158, we tried, uh, applied to the, to the pilot, and our high school got accepted. And so we built from scratch a competency-based education program, which we titled Vanguard Vision. Uh, it is a school within a school. We, I'm proud to say that we are now entering our fourth year. We're about to graduate our first graduating class of students. And essentially within the program, what we did is we allocated one teacher from each of the core subject areas. We blocked together that school within a school for the first several periods of the day. Um, and we had students that were moving together. They were able to use the time flexibly. 
um, as well as there was an affective component where students would be able to focus on what we call our habits of work, life, and learning. And so with this, what our, our dearest hope was, was that we would be able to have students progress at their own pace, own their own learning, and really emerge with a sense of agency, as well as a lot of those soft skills that we know are needed for success. So if you're, if you're thinking through all of those things, um, absolutely some of those things are difficult to measure. Of course, we also had a very important goal of having students grow, right? We wanted to make sure that students were progressing through some of our typical growth measures as well. So if we think about looking at the process, and this is just the same process that John outlined, we looked at our investments, we asked some of the right questions, we evaluated, and then uh, we've taken action, and we're actually still taking action as we're about to graduate our, our first class of students. Um, if anybody's looking at this and thinking, this, this is actually good process management, you know, even if you weren't looking at academic return on investment, anybody who is um, familiar with a plan, do, study, act, or anything like that in terms of goal setting, this is just a great process for us to make sure we're making good decisions. Uh, as well as then making sure that we are getting the outcome that we want. So for our investment on the front end, um, like I said, for that first class, we allocated 4.0 FTE. So that was one teacher from each of the subject areas in the core areas. Um, we did have some uh, just sort of capital issues. We kind of redid some classrooms, innovative furniture and classroom design. Those were easy to quantify and they were one-time expenditures. We had professional learning. So those four teachers had a full year of planning and we actually pulled them out using subtime on a regular basis so that they could design and build. We did have some consulting fees. Um, the state uh, did sponsor some of that, but some of that was locally sponsored on um, some of it through our grants. But in any case, it all goes into the pot in terms of investment. And the final investment, uh, this is a little bit what John was talking about, a little bit of opportunity cost. And I'd be the first to say that, that we probably um, underestimated administrative time needed as an investment to get such a, an innovative program up and running. But nevertheless, we did that. And um, those were those investments that we were quantifying. Then the question that we're asking, and, and we've had this question um, presenting on this program in other contexts, um, has students succeeded? Did their SAT scores go up? You know, things like that, that seem like pretty simple questions. And my answer is um, maybe, maybe not for an individual student. What we were looking at was student growth equal to or exceeding their predicted performance without the program. So like John said, it's not just a matter of did they grow? Um, we would be hard pressed if we had a, a group of kids that didn't grow from the beginning to the end of the year at all or from freshman to senior year. But what we were looking at was compared to their predicted performance, did this program at least get them to where they would have been predicted to be? Then we have all those additional um, pieces like student ownership of learning, our howls, our habits of work, life and learning, social emotional outcomes. And so when we look at those two, those really two questions with multiple factors within those questions, this is where you can start to kind of think in your head and see where some of these analytics, the effect sizes in particular, can really help us. So as we evaluate, and I'm showing you a snapshot from one year, and this is something we're extremely proud of. To be honest, it surprised us a little bit in a good way. Um, this was last year. So the full year of the pandemic, um, we know that across the country, um, we've had unfinished learning. We've had students with some learning gaps at different levels. And so when we looked at, at the growth for our students in our Vanguard program, you can see very, very simply here, um, we have students that were not in Vanguard and students that were in Vanguard. And what we see here is that through the course of the pandemic, our students in Vanguard actually exceeded the growth that we would have expected for them, pandemic aside. So in other words, in this program, something, and it's up to us to make sure we drill down and analyze what that is, but in this program, something is succeeding for our return on investment to say, we know what we put into it. We know what we were hoping to get out. And these students did show higher growth than what they would have experienced in any case. And this was, this was actually cause for much celebration. Um, I remember calling our high school principal and saying, uh, did you see this? Did you see the report? Um, we are very, very excited about it. And it, it also shows that we're doing the right thing. We believe in this program. We believe it's right for kids. 
but we also have to use in education, we have to use our metrics, right? To be able to prove that what we believe is right actually is what's right. So also as we evaluate, this is the part that's a little, it's a little fuzzier. And so I'm just gonna call it out because that's okay too. So while we can measure our growth with the effect size using some of our assessment systems, student ownership of learning. You know, there's ways we can look at that. We, we've built out our habits of work, life and learning through rubrics. We have students that report on them. We have social emotional outcomes we're hoping for. And this is a little bit more anecdotal. So we've run focus groups with kids, with parents. Um, and what we've heard over and over again is, I own my learning. I understand what it takes to succeed. I can monitor myself. I know how to make choices that I didn't know how to make when I started this program. Um, something else I want to mention, just as, as a side note to the program, but it also shows how it's hard to quantify, is that when we dug in on that effect size, that blue, that exceeding effect size, um, one of the things that we heard over and over and over from students about this program is that because it's a school within a school, um, they have very close relationships with their teachers. They over and over again say, my teachers know me, my teachers understand me, they know who I am as a person. I know the other students, we support each other. The teachers, when you hear them talk about their students, it's like they're talking about family members. And so for us, that was really some unintended benefits in the school within a school model that we believe contributed to that effect size so that in the evaluation, we're really able to take a, a really good look at the current reality and figure out what contributed to that so we can make good decisions. Something that I, I sort of touched on a little bit is that student context. And so when we think about any of these items, like I said, if it was a program where we purchased a platform, put some kids in it and measured it, it would probably be pretty straightforward. But I'm bringing this up on, on, in this program because I think it is important to see that while academic return on investment can be very mathematical, we do also have to take into account that we're working with people. So we look at our student context, things like um, personally, what are our students' goals? What are their priorities, their aspirations? We have some students that their goal is to enter a career pathway. We have some students that their goal is to go to Harvard. Some students, it's both. We have some where um, you know, they're focusing on their family or they're helping out at home. All these different pieces really lend to who our students are. So if we're talking about student growth as our outcome and that really being the metric, both for success, but also for return on investment, we also make sure that we take into account student context because that's the umbrella and that's really the foundation as well for any achievement and growth. And last, we act. Um, should we continue to invest? Well, for four years, we have said yes. Uh, we've grown the program. We've added a, a set of teachers and an additional class of students for four years. So we're running freshman through senior now. Um, and we are going to graduate our first class of seniors this year here in Huntley District 158. So some of the decisions that, that we have to make about these sorts of things is continuation of the program. For us, it's not whether it continues, but it's how. Um, are we going to adjust or refine the program? A perfect example of an adjustment we've made, and it was just, again, unintended. We built a school within a school that had some pretty strong boundaries around it. Um, what we realized is that as students wanted to take AP classes or wanted to um, move forward in an honors class or something like that, our program didn't allow for it. So we had to adjust and we, we had to remove some of those boundaries so that we could again continue to get that return on investment with the overall student growth and really serving the whole child. The other thing we have to determine is how do we decide to scale the program for greater impact? Do we scale it throughout other subject areas? Do we scale it through the building? Do we allow teachers to make more choices? Um, those are the types of things that are under discussion now. And, and the beauty of this is that it's really just part of a solid continuous improvement process with academic return on investment as a basis, but the process lets us make those good decisions. Um, and so for us, that's our Vanguard Vision Program. Like I said, not the most straightforward example that I could give you, but that's really why I chose it. Also because again, innovative program that we're proud of and that we are just so thrilled with the results that it offered our students. We'll be watching closely this year, um, hoping to see more of that high effect size. Um, and so with that, um, we've looked at kind of the overarching model, as well as some of the metrics and analytics, as well as a practical application. Um, and so with that, we are 
going to be able to take any questions. Um, yeah, and so uh, thanks everybody. And you know, before we go right into questions, there's a there's a couple of of comments that Erica made that I just want to give a, another context to because I think are really really important. And so I want to uh, recognize that uh, um, there's there's two things that you can think about as you, you think about academic ROI that Erica um, touched on is one is even if you don't have the the uh, investments quantified in an actual dollar amount, right? In our experience, we have lots of school districts that engage in academic return on investment for the student return piece, right? That's really just about understanding the impact that all of their programs are having on student outcomes, even if they don't have a handle on exactly the investment piece. And I think you saw that with Erica's example in that um, they still, they knew the investments that they were making and they, they were listed at all. They didn't go as far as quantifying it exactly to a, to a specific dollar amount, but all of the academic ROI still applies because it's still all about that action, that, that return on student outcomes. So that's, you know, that's the, the first piece. Uh, the other piece is, you know, when you think about that metric of an effect size and you think about um, how that relates to the inference and the actions that you're taking is, you know, depending on what the program's designed to impact, it's it's that green region that we're talking about, that, that um, when a program produces results that are consistent with the core program, we call that potential ROI because depending on what the program's designed to do, you may interpret that as positive, you may interpret that as negative. And I think that the example that Erica showed when she went back to that question early on and she asked the question, it has to be as good or better, the reason why they asked the question, I, mean, I, I believe the way the probably the reason you you ask the question as good or better is because the program was designed to impact such a wide range of outcomes beyond the growth metrics that you were used to document that ROI. So if you showed that you had um, green results, that would have been positive because mm -hmm. of all of the other experiences that students were exposed to, and you still would have gotten the same academic growth and you would have exposed students to all these additional opportunities. So I think that's a great illustration that um, blue is not the only academic ROI that matters. Green matters if, in fact, your program is designed uh, to do a wide range of, of things and give a wide range of experiences that are beyond um, just what you're measuring. So I think that that was a really good, um, a good illustration of that. And lastly, uh, I would say that the other great thing about using the metric of an effect size, uh, I think Erica touched on this, but I just want to kind of echo it, is there's actually an effect size for each and every student. So like in this conversation, we're talking about making inferences at the program level. We're talking about, did it actually provide academic return on investment at the program level? But if you consider underneath that, every single student has their own effect size in terms of how they benefited as an individual student from a program. So as you work through this process, it's not only about making the judgment at the program level, it's also about digging in and looking at the effect size for each and every student to ask the question, was this program equitably received by all students? Because we see a lot that there may be programs that are working overall as a group in aggregate, but there still may be students underneath that that are not benefiting. And so the ability to drill down and look not only at the program overall, but to look at each and every student and how they benefited individually from a program, I think is a really important point. So, um, so thanks Erica for sharing that. I think that that, uh, uh, that really, uh, for me, uh, shed a lot of light on kind of how this works uh, works in practice. And so with that, uh, we will go ahead and take uh, questions. You can uh, put those questions to questions at echogroup.com and, uh, and we'll moderate that and, uh, and, and go from there. So I guess I'll start, I'll moderate the questions, Erica, and then I'll kind of uh, lob them back and forth. So one of the questions that came in is what data can you use uh, to measure ROI, and so um, this is a this is a great question because one of the one of the parts of the process that we um, that we presented here is asking that question. You know, if in fact a program um, is effective, what would we expect to see? And so, uh, what data can we use? I'm going to answer that question in terms of 
um, what is the kinds of data that we most uh, that we see most often because of student growth being the outcome that people are really interested in. And so most of what we're seeing in terms of academic return on investment is the use of assessment data, the use of universally administered assessments, whether that's coming from your state assessments, whether that's coming from your interim benchmark assessments like an NWEA map, uh, whether that's coming from some other universal uh, assessments that you're uh, that you're using. Uh, that's most of what we see. Now, the process could apply to all uh, sorts of data beyond that, but the sort of um, discipline calculation of effect size um, we're seeing is mostly done through assessment data. And I don't know, Erica, if you want to add to any uh, any of that. Yeah, the only piece that I would add is just on the practitioner side as a school district. Um, uh, so, for example, we we obviously have screeners, we purchase, we have state assessments, just like many do, but um, we did switch it. Uh, unfortunately, right before the pandemic started, we made a large shift in our assessment system. And um, what was really great about it is that these analytics still work. So ECRA Group is able to advise us and to use the statistical model in ways that would be very difficult for us if we were just saying, oh gosh, we have a new baseline. What are we going to do now? We have to look at what's happening with the pandemic. Um, we've been able to use the statistical model and the support that ECHO Group provides to be able to put that in context and to use, continue to use the growth model and the effect sizes, um, regardless of the fact that internally we did shift those assessments. And so I just wanted to mention that, John, because I think that's something that's real hard for districts um, if, if we're really truly just looking at scores on a test. Right. No, and I think that that's a, I think that's fantastic because there's a lot of data um, is part of a process like academic return mm -hmm. on investment and um, incorporating data that's beyond just the formal calculation of effect size is equally as important to understand the story of, of mm -hmm. those students. So I think that that's uh, um, yeah, that's that's great insight. So as that's kind of a um, a precursor to another question that's mm -hmm. coming in here, and that's um, how do, how do you account for student demographic differences when you measure growth? And so, you know, this is a potentially a very technical topic, but um, I, you know, I'll answer the question, uh, you know, this way, and this is, this is over decades and decades of research and, and good policy, right, is that the way in which academic return on investment is calculated um, accounts for all those contextual factors, but doesn't adjust for any of them. And let, let me give you an example for what that is and why that is, right? Um, the, the power behind a framework like this is that we're looking one student at a time. We're personalizing our expectations for each and every student based on their unique academic record. And so if you consider, you know, Johnny and how Johnny's been growing over a period of time and using Johnny's own learning trajectory to project out where Johnny likely would have ended up so that we can compare where he actually ended up and quantify that ROI, the expectations are personal, are personal to Johnny, right? So the nice thing about that is we don't need to think about how other variables are affecting Johnny because we're only talking about Johnny. And so any influence that certain demographics or, or contextual factors have on him, they've been having all along. So as long as we're using his own history as a way to project out where he's likely going to be, then um, all of those other influences are mitigated to an ignorable level. And this is well-researched going, you know, going back a, a very long period of time. But the nice thing about a framework like that is it really promotes the idea of personalized learning. And it's, it's good science because what do we know as scientists? If we're trying to isolate the impact of a particular variable on outcomes, right? We know that randomized controlled trials are the, are the gold standard, right? And so, uh, in education, though, it's really difficult to run randomized control trials, right, where we randomize some groups to the program and some groups not. I mean, I don't think anybody in the audience here would want to send letters home to, to parents saying that their son or daughter needs to stay home, that they're in a control group, right? But what do we know as scientists, right? We know that in the absence of randomization, longitudinal data tracking is the next best thing. And so this idea of using a student's own history as the basis to form their own control or their own benchmark, right, is the foundational analytical approach uh, to academic return on investment. And then the last question is, what does the timeline and process look like to implement this kind of work? So Erica, maybe you're the best person to take that one and talk a little bit about what implementation of this looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I, you know, I think I can answer that on two levels. So 
just from the perspective of continuous goal setting, you know, I think that can be on any cycle that you want it to be, um, depending on what it is that you're trying to get done. So if you're talking about like a school improvement plan that that lasts for a year, you know, you you'd typically have a cycle, you'd be measuring it throughout the year, and then you look at some final reporting. Um, however, there may be some shorter term pieces that, that we're trying to measure specifically to a program that we've got students in and we're measuring it after nine weeks or anything like that. So to be honest, the framework is simple enough that you could work through that, you know, investment, question, evaluate and act as quickly as you need to in a cycle for what you need to get done. What I will say, though, is that using the metrics, what we typically do is um we have a, a, an overall winter report and an overall spring report. So we typically do that three times a year benchmarking. And so for us, it makes a lot of sense that if we are going to be looking at that return on investment or looking at effect size for any other reason, that we would typically say, OK, we'll monitor as we go along, maybe using some of our other platforms, the individual assessments. And then we would look at that effect size maybe after that winter benchmarking or after that spring benchmarking. And so that's not necessarily like a technical analytical answer, but it has a little bit more to do with practitioners and um, how do you set goals for what purpose are you setting goals? And then just what's your available data or the, the most important pieces of data to measure them. For us, like the example I gave you, that was our end of year report. So that was all in, all assessments that those students took um, for that Vanguard program. Uh, that were those um, universal assessments, like John said, that was our end of year report. And so we were able to see the full year reflected in that. And John, I don't know if you have anything to yeah. add to yeah. that. You know, the only thing that I would add is, you know, in, in our experience, those that uh, those districts um, that have been doing this a while, you know, like like Erica is, this becomes a, just a systemic approach to the use of data within the school district, that it's just something that falls out of the way that they do business because they've adopted at a most at the foundational level analyzing every single kid and using every single student to uh, uh, to basically uh, make sure that they're better off this year than they were last year, taking a very personalized approach to benchmarking and moving beyond just benchmarking to state and national averages. And so this kind of a framework can be systemic to drive all of the major chunks of work within the district. So you can, you can imagine using this uh, kind of a framework even to link it into a student identification and student placement. Because if you know how a student is growing leading up to a particular school school year, for example, and you know that that how, what that trajectory means in terms of um, where they're likely to grow when they go to fall, winter, and spring through the subsequent school year, you can proactively act on that student and make sure that they're getting into the right programs and interventions. So it's not just the sort of the retrospective program evaluation piece that ROI does, it also is the prospective piece of making sure that you have visibility into the future before the future happens so that you can get the right students into the right programs. So there's that there's that placement piece of it. And then, you know, I think you touched on it too, but um, as part of the goal setting process, uh, you know, a lot of times in uh, in school districts, we're always uh, sitting around a table asking, like, what should our goal for the year be in terms of, you know, student achievement? The nice thing about a framework like this is those goals are kind of set for you automatically, because if you know that there's a particular group of students as part of a school improvement uh, plan or initiative, um, this academic ROI framework is going to project out for each and every student where they're likely to end up if you don't roll that school improvement initiative out. So that becomes your goalpost. That becomes that we need to beat the value that the model's producing. And you can generate unique uh, goals for any combination of students because all it's doing is it's rolling it up from the student level. And so when you think about the implementation of this, it really is a systemic implementation that drives your placement processes, that drives your school improvement processes, that drives the, the um, equity work around making sure that all students are benefiting from the programs that you're putting them in. Even if the program overall is shown effective, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily effective for all kids. So, you know, I think um, I think that systemic piece is really important because it's not, it doesn't have to be, it can be just about academic ROI and generating the report, the kind of reports that we've showed, but it can also be a much more systemic framework. What, uh, what's another question we have in here? Um, so we have another question coming in. Uh, do you incorporate the fact that some students are involved in more than one program 
um, which is having an impact. So we have some technical questions that are coming from yeah. this audience. So, <laughs> um, so I can make a comment on this from a technical standpoint, and then you know, Erica, if you mm -hmm. want to. Um, share any other insights you know into this is um the the power of this model right is it's using students own histories right to, to again to project out where they're likely going to end up and it also borrows information from the rest of the school district right about what we know about similar students and so for so one way to think about what the model is really capturing right is the effect of the core program or the effect of this sort of general program for a specific student mm -hmm. right that becomes that you know that that becomes the the projection and then the intervention or the program becomes right of the all these new things that we're doing you know with with johnny for example so depending on how you've architected those programs right um you may or may not be able to untangle some of those so if, if you're literally giving johnny two new interventions that are simultaneous to one another right? Where he's basically, he's going into intervention A and he's going to intervention B over the exact same period of time, right? Doing the exact same things. Now you're sort of judging the collective uh, efficacy of both of those together, right? It's going to be difficult to untangle those. However, in other scenarios um, where those are a little bit different, different outcomes, different time points, um, you can untangle them. And so it all just depends on sort of the nature of um, of how those programs are rolled out and how the participation patterns actually work. And the only thing I would add to that, I can provide a, an example, actually, it, it comes to mind at our middle school level. So we have a vo voluntary after school tutoring program. We just started this year called Student Success. And so we have a group of kids that we've invited to come to that and, and they're getting help after school. Some of those kids may also be in other interventions. And, and what John says is absolutely true for an individual student there's really not necessarily a way to know exactly which of those pieces unless we're measuring different skills potentially uh, with what the help is provided. But what I will say is that um, that's where it does help to program, to take a step back and kind of shine that spotlight a little wider and look at it programmatically. So for an individual student that might be in an intervention and be in our student success tutoring, it is hard to know. But if we look at our student success program, back to the program level, and the program is showing good gains as a program, I think we can make some good assumptions about that. Um, although like for an individual student, it may not be possible to pull those pieces right. apart. And Eric, I think that that's a fantastic point because I glossed over that point that there, there really is this piece about understanding the impact at the student level versus understanding mm -hmm. the impact at the group level. And they're kind so, of two different things, but they're complementary, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. But some of the limitations that may apply to an individual student may mm -hmm. not apply to the group. And I think you, um, your commentary is spot on there because even though Johnny may have been sort of simultaneously in two interventions side by mm -hmm. side, there's other students that may have been in one and not the other. And mm -hmm. so, so the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that, um, in all likelihood, and it's been our experience that you can untangle simultaneous interventions at the group level, but you may not be able to do that at the individual kid level for certain kids. And so I think that's, that was, uh, um, I think that was, uh, really insightful. So any other questions uh, coming in? Last chance for questions. Otherwise, we'll we'll uh, go ahead and wrap up here and give it uh, give it one or two more uh, uh, seconds here. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for for tuning into this AESA webinar. Um, it's been fun, and uh, we we are recording this uh, this webinar, and so at some point we uh, we will post this on our website, and the events page will will post this recording. So if those of you that want to go back and share it with your teams, or um, just want to be able to to go back over certain pieces of it, uh, this will be uh, recorded and shared. Um, Erica, do you have any closing comments before we sign off here? Just to say again, thank you for attending and, and thank you for letting us share with you um, some of our both ideas and also practical applications. Um, we think it's powerful and um, we're happy if it helps anyone. Please feel free to reach out to either of us individually as well. Um, right. Really happy to engage in a conversation. Yeah, that's great. You can continue to to ask questions on that questions at ecogroup.com. Mm -hmm. uh, there are more resources on our website as well. Um, but with that, thanks everybody for, for tuning in and uh, we hope to see you again for